I had a discussion with someone on Facebook today and I found it interesting enough that I actually wanted to make a video about it. The conversation started with someone making the claim that that Intel was better than Ryzen because Intel was more efficient. And the claim that Intel was more efficient was based on the fact that Intel's voltages are lower. I'm not sure how you can think that lower voltages means better efficiency. I mean, it's part of the component and low voltages can contribute to better efficiency, but low voltages alone doesn't mean better efficiency. But during the discussion, I realized that it might not be really common knowledge what exactly these components of electricity mean and how they're relevant to electronics. First of all, I want to talk about something called Ohm's Law, or at least part of Ohm's Law, I guess an aspect of it that I can explain very easily. There are four terms, actually there are many terms in uh, when you're talking about electricity, different ways of measuring different things, um, but there's four that I'm going to talk about today and four that you'll probably hear quite, quite a bit. Um, there's amperage, voltage, resistance or ohms, and power in watts. And they're all very much related. And the way I'm gonna explain it is using an analogy. So here I'm in my kitchen in Beverly Hills. No, I'm kidding. Uh, I'm gonna use water and specifically tap water to help, to help explain the flow of electricity and the relationships. Current is basically how much electricity is actually passing through a thing. So in this case, current goes to explain quantity. So like, how long does it take to fill a bowl? The more current there is, the faster the bowl is going to fill. Nothing else matters, not pressure, not, not anything like that. It's just sheer how much power is passing or how much current is passing over time, how much charge is passing over time. That's amperage. Now, resistance and voltage are very intrinsically linked. To increase your voltage, you increase the resistance. So, so voltage, when compared to water, is like pressure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn on this tap. I'm going to add some cold so I don't burn myself. So, so notice that the, there's, there's a bit of pressure here, but it's generally falling pretty freely. So what I do is if I take my thumb and provide a resistance, notice how it really kind of shoots out of there. and now it's just kind of falling loosely. That's because the amperage or the current remained the same, but I increased the resistance, which increased the pressure and thus the voltage increases in this analogy. And then there's something magical called power in watts. You know, you buy a 650 watt power supply, you hear about your CPU or your GPU's TDP in watts. Well, what does that mean? Um, it means power, and power is amperage times the voltage. So it's just the current, so how much is going, times the pressure. So think, imagine two water streams side by side. They have the same voltage, the same pressure, so they'll have the same arc. They'll, they'll fall together, but one of them is much larger. So there's a lot more water passing th through this one current compared to the other smaller current. But the arcs are the same because there's the same voltage. I'm kind of crossing terms to help explain this. But the one, since there's more volume, there's more current, say if you like put your hand in the way, you're going to feel a lot more force than through the small one, even though the pressure, the even though the pressure is the same. Now let's draw this discussion back to CPUs. So we have two CPUs. We have, say, an Intel i7-7700K and a Ryzen 5 1600X. Now these two CPUs require different voltages. So if you want to run 4 gigahertz on each of them, the i7 is probably going to take, what, one point. 1.5 volts, maybe 1.2 volts. 1.2 volts can usually get you a decent clock on, on an i7. Whereas on a Ryzen, if you want, I mean, 
my Ryzen 5 1600X is running at uh, 1.4, a little bit over 1.4 volts, and it's running uh, 4.05 gigahertz. So the voltage is higher and the clock speed's lower. Oh, that means it's inefficient. Hmm, except it's not. Let's discuss this using the terms that we already know that we've discussed in this video. We have voltage, which is the pressure. So clearly Ryzen requires higher pressure of the power of the electricity. Great. Um, but does that mean it's using more power? Actually, not at all, because the wattage is actually less. So the power in watts is actually less. That means the amperage, so if the amperage times voltage equals the wattage, or if the voltage is higher and the wattage is lower, that means the amperage must be much lower. That means it's using less power. It's going to be less intense on your power bill. Now wait, can we compare voltages directly between Intel and Ryzen? Why is Intel's voltages so much lower than Ryzen's voltages? I'm going to be honest, the fact that Ryzen's voltages are so high isn't a good thing, but it's not necessarily a really bad thing either. I think there is a solid chance, and I don't know this for sure, this is speculation, but I think there is a good chance that the reason that Ryzen doesn't overclock well over four gigahertz is the high voltage requirement. I, I predict that in future iterations of the Zen architecture, the voltage requirement is going to be iterated down. And once that voltage requirement is iterated down, then there's going to be a lot more overclocking headroom. But wait, you just said that power efficiency is in the wattage, which is more related to the amperage and not the voltage. So why do you want lower voltages? Also, if Ryzen's power is already lower than Intel's, what's the problem? The problem is why Ryzen's power is lower than Intel's. And, and Ryzen's power is lower than Intel's because the amperage is far lower. It's actually true that naturally, in, in its natural state, Ryzen should be less efficient than Intel's chips. But that's not true, and why is that not true? See, there's something called AMD Sense MI, which has a bunch of different aspects. One of those aspects includes a pile of sensors all around the Ryzen chip that will naturally detect what parts of the chip aren't being used and underclock those in a far more advanced way than Intel does. Even though the trans there are far more transistors on a Ryzen chip and a higher voltage across those transistors, in, in fact, without this technology, if you apply a full voltage across an entire active Ryzen chip, it should be, in fact, far more power consuming than the equivalent Intel chip. However, AMD's intelligent technology to dynamically reduce the clock speeds and operation of the dormant parts of the chip are what drastically reduce the amperage draw. So there's less parts of the chip using power at any given time, thus it needs less current to operate. This means in extreme levels, this chip is able to operate with less current than its Intel counterpart. And it's the l far lower current that causes the lower power. Without this ability for the Ryzen chip to dynamically underclock the parts of the CPU that aren't being used at the moment, it would be far more power consuming and much hotter than its Intel counterpart. It would be almost like bulldozer all over again. This was a very good move on in AMD's part to implement, and it's very much a saving grace for them. In the future, I believe that AMD will 
put work into bringing down that voltage requirement. And as AMD brings down that voltage requirement over iterations of the architecture, then the overclockability is going to increase drastically. Now let's extend this discussion over into Threadripper and the new exciting i9 that just came out. What does it mean? In fact, I'm very excited to find out what performs better between AMD's Ryzen Threadripper and the Intel i9 7980 XE. Jeez, these names are getting convoluted. Anyway, there's two, thi there's two very different CPUs, one with 16 cores and one with 18 cores. So, it, so Intel has the advantage of core count. They also have the advantage of IPC because now we're on to Skylake. While Ryzen had the advantage in IPC instructions per clock, so how much work it did per cycle per chip, compared to Broadwell, Ryzen was performing slightly better, but compared to Skylake, the new thing, actually kind of an old thing, but new on the enthusiast platform, Skylake is slightly faster per core per clock. That means Intel has two main advantages. This i9-7980XE has two more cores and slightly faster per clock. So we can try to guess as to what the performance of these two CPUs is going to be by guessing at what the clock speeds are going to be. Now, this is where it gets interesting. I have no doubt that given an extremely high performance cooling solution that the i9 chip is going to outperform Threadripper because it's not going to have that 4 gigahertz ceiling which Threadripper, Threadripper absolutely will have. Nobody is going to get a Threadripper to hit 4.2 gigahertz on water. That's not going to happen. I would be surprised to see Threadripper hit 4.5 gigahertz on liquid nitrogen, but we'll see. I'm sure they'll try. They'll try to overclock it. We'll see what it gets to. I could be proven wrong, but certainly in an everyday build, it's not going to be over 4.1 gigahertz. It's not happening. Whereas Intel, those 18 cores might be. So if those 18 cores under extremely ideal conditions might be able to hit 4.5 gigahertz. That's what I've known the 6950X to hit is 4.5 gigahertz under ideal liquid cooling solutions. The thing is, under most conditions that those CPUs are gonna be in, that Threadripper is going to more easily hit that four gigahertz because of its ideal because of its ability to reduce its power consumption and thus heat output, because there's amperage and voltage, those two together make power, and power, as you increase power, you increase your heat output. So my theory, as it stands, I think most systems, most Threadripper systems are going to outperform the i9 system in everyday situations with moderate liquid cooling, certainly not air cooling without many CP or without many cores. Jeez, you don't want a weak cooling solution. Otherwise you're going to hit what two, like maybe two and a half gigahertz, pro probably two and a half gigahertz, which is really low. I mean, nobody wants that in their, in their home PC. That's server stuff. But with like moderate liquid cooling s solutions, this i9 might be hard to get above 3.5 gigahertz. And if that i9 can't hit at least 3.6 to 3.8 gigahertz on all cores, it's going to be beaten by Threadripper. On 18 cores, that's a lot of cores producing heat. It's going to be hard to do that. But maybe Intel has a way. We'll see. I'm very excited to find out the results of this. I won't be able to test it myself because I'm not that rich, but I'm looking forward to other tech reviewers giving the results. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm sorry I haven't been making videos lately. I've just been not super feeling great, not feeling up to it, been busy with other things, combination of things, excuses, excuses, excuses. Anyway, thanks for watching, thanks for joining. I'll try to have more videos up more frequently, try to keep posting content for you guys. 
Um, and please let me know your thoughts down below.